Hi everyone. I thought at this time in the course I would just take a few moments and go through some slides that talk about P and IDs and some of the symbols that are used. If you've already taken the course EMEC 125, you can skip this presentation or you can use this as a refresher or as a short tutorial on how to read P and IDs and um, about some of the basic symbols that are used on these diagrams. P and IDs are documents that technicians will use when troubleshooting and or repairing instrumentation. The symbols must be understood and are defined by a standard produced by ANSI, which is the American National Standards Institute, under ISA, and ISA is the International Society of Automation, formerly the Instrument Society of America. Standard number 5.1, which was updated in 2009. However, even with this standard, there is no real standard that specifies how much information and what type of information should be on PNIDs. Because there is no standard, this can cause a lot of confusion when a technician or an engineer is trying to decipher the meaning of a unique symbol that a designer or another technician included on a PNID. It's good practice that if you're going to use a custom symbol or a unique symbol that doesn't appear in any standards or any type of documentation book, that on the PNID you include a, a note or a key that shows you the symbol and what it is that that symbol is representation, representing. Even after looking in myself, even after looking at, at many PNIDs, every once in a while I'll see a symbol and I'll, I'll look at it and say, what is that? I've never seen that symbol before. Uh, and, and, you know, I've got to take time then to look it up or try to figure out based on where it is in the drawing what purpose it has and what instrument it is or, or what function does it serve. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to use a custom symbol, which I do not recommend, you know, put a note on the drawing with the symbol and what it means. PNID is an acronym, and there's no real universal um, standard for what PNID actually represents, although there is accepted phrases. First of all, the P usually will stand for piping or process. Those are the two most common terms that you'll use for the P. The I represents instrumentation or just instrument and the D could mean either drawing or diagram. So P and I D can be piping and instrumentation diagrams. It could be process and instrumentation diagrams. It could be piping and instrument drawings. You know, so no matter what the person is saying or how it is being talked about, they're exactly the same documents. There is a brand new standard that is not yet released in the making to try and standardize on the symbols used for instruments, for line types, for piping diagrams, for how loops in the process are numbered, how instruments are tagged and labeled. And this new standard is designated to be the, the ISA 5.7 standard. Currently, the standard that ISA is using is the ANSI ISA 5.1 2009 standard. 
And again, even though ISA and the American National Standards Institute references this as a standard, it is not required by industry to follow everything that's in that standard. So what is typically found on PNIDs? This slide is showing us that typically you're going to have instrument lists. You might call it an index that includes document specifications, where instruments have been purchased, how they're installed, where they're located, the type of instrument that is being used. You'll see motor lists showing any pump motor sizes or blower motor sizes, the horsepower, the voltage ratings, is it single phase, is it three phase? You'll see different piping symbols. You'll see the line size, the line list, what kind of service is being provided, what purpose are these pipes providing. And you'll also see tanks and vessels and information about those tanks and vessels. Are they open to atmosphere? Are they closed to atmosphere? Is there pressure on them or lack of pressure, meaning vacuum? So all of this information is used as a help to lay out the equipment, to start specifying and purchasing the necessary equipment, or as a maintenance tech to say, you know what, here's an instrument that I know is faulty. I can look at the PNID, look up that instrument, and find out exactly what instrument it is and where it was purchased the last time it was bought. A control loop, and we've talked about control loops in <clears throat> this course so far, briefly. A control loop, though, is nothing more than a collection of equipment that consists of at least three devices that are used to automatically control a process or are part of the process. The three most common devices in a loop are a transmitter used to sense the process variable and transmit the measured variable to a controller, a controller that's used to compare the process variable with some sort of set point and generate a signal based on that comparison, and you'll also have a final control element that corrects the process. Just last week, we talked about control valves. It was just a very brief introduction to control valves. That topic in itself could be a course. That's a final control element, and you, a control valve could be used to make corrections to the process by adjusting level, by adjusting flow rates, and so on and so forth. So. As I stated earlier, the ANSI ISA 5.1 is most often used by designers as a standard for symbology. Even though it's, again, it's not a standard by, you know, law, most people follow that standard. And here's a direct quote from that standard. The symbols and identification methods contained in this standard have evolved by the consensus method and are intended for wide application throughout all industries. The symbols and designations are used as conceptualizing aids, as design tools, as teaching devices, and as a concise and specific means of communication in all types and kinds of technical engineering, procurement, construction, and maintenance documents, and not just in piping and instrumentation diagrams. So what's in this standard, what that says in a nutshell is, what's in this standard was devised and designed by consensus of a wide variety of industries that worked with the American National Standards Institute and with the International Society of Automation 
to in the attempt to standardize on specific types of symbols, loop designators, instrument callouts and descriptions so that when going from one company to another, even from going from one country to another, people will understand the symbology and the, the documentation. The identification letters that all instruments have or should have are also referenced in this standard. There is a list of these stand are these letters in the standard. Then the standard lists the preferred first letter and the succeeding letters that are as part of the identification. The standard will also list typical letter combinations so that the user is not going to just create their own letter combinations. So the standard will also list, you know, if I have a flow indicator controller, I should be using this letter combination, which in that case would be FIC. You want to try to keep this list handy when you are drawing or creating PNIDs. Let me just stop this slideshow for a moment and I'm going to open up the standard and I'm going to go to the page within the standard whereby there is a table showing the identification letters. So here is this table, it's on page 30 and by the way this standard is available in the course documents section of your course. So if you go to Blackboard, go to Course Documents, and that's under the Shortcuts area, you will find the ANSI ISA 5.1 standard at, that you can reference for the rest of this course or in the future. And you'll see that there are first letters and succeeding letter columns. So if I had a flow, if I had an FIC, I see that the first letter is F, which means flow or flow rate. The second letter I had, or the succeeding letters, are I, C. So let's look for the I, and the succeeding letter says indicate. And I have a C after that, which could mean control, if it's an output active function, or close if it's a function modifier. Well, we are using, I'm using this as, a, as an output function. So FIC in this case would be a flow indicate control. So you could build those things, those, those, those letter combinations from this standard. And here's another example of that, uh, that list. I just took a screenshot of that list and pasted it in this slide. When you're working on a system or you're building a system, all instruments should have a metal, a plastic, or a paper tag attached to them that states an instrument identification number. This number is known as a tag number. Most places, most companies either use metal or plastic. Paper doesn't tend to stay long. It does, it tends to fade off. It rips, it's, you know, with moisture or anything that's gone. And so metal or plastic is your best choices. So there are several different numbering schemes that are used. However, industry is trying to, to make everything new meet some sort of the standard. The, alpha, the tag numbers are an alphanumeric code. So you'll have the alpha portion of it, which we just talked about. And then you'll have a numeric portion of it. And the numeric portion is normally a loop number. So I may have a, a flow control system that has a 
flow controller, a valve, and, and um, an indicator. And that might be loop 25. So those three instruments would be labeled with an identification letter sequence and the loop number. So the smaller tag num and the smaller the tag numbers, the better. And you'll see later in this slide presentation that you know these symbols are small, so you want to keep the numbers small so they fit within the symbol itself. So some of the typical tag numbers that you might see, like one is PDT-102, is an instrument identification or tag number. The PDT is a function identification. The 102 happens to be a loop identification or a loop number. The P is the first letter and the DT is the succeeding letters. So you could go to that table and look up PDT to find out exactly what it is that that letter combination represents. The most common identifiers that are used in process are F for flow, L for level, P for pressure, T for temperature. The hyphens that you may see are optional. If you see an instrument where the letter X as the first letter, this is a special case. And in the ANSI ISA 5.1 standard, it states that first letter or succeeding letter for unclassified devices or functions using the letter X for non-repetitive meanings that shall be defined outside tagging bubbles or by a note in the document. So if you have some sort of an instrument that's a special case instrument, it's a special case type function, there's no real identification listed in the standard, you can use the letter X as part of the identification. It is also recommended that you then put a note on the drawing what that actually represents. So the symbology is, is graphical building blocks and the symbols are, are made up of circles. Some places call them bubbles. They're squares and rectangles, triangles, half circles, lines, slashes, arrow points, so on and so forth. Instrument location information. ISA standard instrument symbols, locations, and accessibility are also shown as part of the symbol. So these symbols are also used to help identify the type of instrument that you're looking at. It's also going to give you an idea of the location is that instrument located in the field? Some instruments are mounted right on the process. It's in the field. Is it maybe not on the panel or a console or cabinet mounted? Is it visible at the field location or not visible? <laughs> is it accessible to the operator? Some instruments are, some instruments are not. Is it located in or on front of the central or main control panel? Is it visible on the front panel? Is it located at the rear of the main or central panel? Or maybe it's not even accessible to the operator when it's on the panel or on the console. All of this information is depicted in the symbol that is used. And here are some of the symbol types that ISA recommends being used. These symbols are for field mounted devices. You'll see a circle is just a discrete instrument. This stop sign looking thing, I guess it's a hexagon, is a computer system or represents software. I have a diamond with a square in it. This is a safety instrumented system. 
which is SIS. And throughout the sequence of the courses in this series, you'll learn something about SIS. Or a circle with a square is a basic process control system. But the key thing is, is that these symbols mean that those devices are field mounted. Then there are the symbols. Notice the only difference in these symbols is that there is now a line, a horizontal line drawn through them. These are the same type of symbols, however, they are, they are normally accessible to operators. So just because it's field mounted doesn't necessarily mean it's accessible to operators, but these are accessible to operators. Then there are that's the same symbols, only with a horizontal dashed line. These types of instruments are normally inaccessible to operators, so the operator can't get to them, or they're mounted behind a panel, behind a console. Or again, the operator doesn't have accessibility to them. Same symbols double horizontal line. These are auxiliary locations, maybe in an auxiliary console, maybe in an auxiliary panel, someplace not in the main control room. However, they are accessible to the operator. A double dashed line. They are normally inaccessible to the operator. They are in an auxiliary location. They are behind the panel or console and therefore again not accessible by the operator. There are then some symbols that um, are different than what we just saw. This first symbol here is a discrete instrument that we can go by. It's mounted in the field but what this is showing you is that it is an instrument with a very long tag number. Remember I mentioned that a long tag number is not very good because as you can see the tag number itself is running outside of the symbol and it, it actually gets very difficult to read. Two circles together, in this case again, it's a field mounted instrument but that means that the instruments are sharing a common housing so I may have a a one instrument and another instrument that work together and they're in the same instrument housing it's not mandatory to show instruments in a common housing however it's a good idea to do that because that gives you even more information about you know, what is in that particular instrument. Here's a diamond with a P associated with it. This is purge or flush device. These diamonds are going to be approximately half the size of larger ones, and that means the diamonds that are in the um, instrument type symbols. This diamond is, with an R in it, is a reset for a latch type actuator. So there are special symbols that are used. That's why I, I always like to keep that list of symbols and list of designators handy when I'm going through any kind of PNID, especially for the first time. Here's some more different types of symbols. A diamond with an I in it is an undefined interlock logic. Here is a panel mounted patch board, point 12. Panel mounted, I can see the panel mounted. Here's a diaphragm seal and a pilot light. If you, when you look in the standard, there are table after table full of different symbols. Instrument line symbols also have different functions. A solid line is an instrument supply or connection to a process. If I have a line with slashed lines on it, 
This is an undefined signal. A line with double slashes is pneumatic symbol. Electrical sig signals have two different line types. It's a dashed line or a solid line with three slash marks. Y you're going to probably see the dashed line as being the most common and the most popular line symbol for electrical. Hydraulic uses a solid line with these little L symbols along the line. Capillary tubes, solid line with X's on them. Electromagnetic or sonic signal guide, line with little sine waves on them. Electromagnetic or, or sonic signal, that's not guided. So these are guided uh, electromagnetic signals. These are unguided. No line, just little sine waves. Internal system links, software or data links, lines with circles on them. You may not know what a lot of these things are yet, and that's okay. You're not at that point yet. As you go through the course, you're going to learn about all of this type of things. Mechanical link is a solid line with solid dots on them. There are some optional line symbols for pneumatic binary. Pneumatic logic is not used a whole lot in today's world. However, it's a solid line with these forward and backward slash marks on it. And electronic binary symbols are the dashed line with diagonals on it or the line with three slashes and one the opposite direction. Um, so many times electronic binary signals will just be represented by a dashed line without the slashes. Then we have all the valve symbols. And even though we just talked about valves, you may not know what all the valve types are, but each valve type has a symbol. Uh, it's basically a, a bow tie shaped symbol that then has some sort of a modifier on it to designate what type of valve it is. Like just a bow tie is a generic two-way valve uh, that usually is a gate valve or some sort of straight globe valve. You can see a little dot here for a generic two-way gate valve. This is the same actual symbol. Sometimes they'll show it with a dot. A little circle designates a ball valve. There's a screw down. That's a hand-operated valve usually. Here's a generic two-way valve. And you can look at the various different symbols of these valves. And there are a whole list of these valves in the ISA standard. Here are also valves that are pressure reducing or pressure regulating valves where they have their own internal type feedback for monitoring pressure or have pressure uh, type reliefs on them. Sometimes this little symbol up here means that it's spring returned. There are also flow type val um, symbols so that here's a pitted tube and I know that we've already talked about some of the flow instruments and we talked about some pitted tubes here's a turbine propeller flow meter here's a vortex shielding meter that is also a rotometer magnetic flow meters positive displacement variable area which is also a rotometer type um, instrument. These are differential pressure flow meters. And again, we talked just a little bit in this course about the differential pressure and the differential pressure flow meters, but these are the symbols that are then used for those. These are orifice plate types. It's a symbol that looks like the two fittings with an orifice plate with the, the gap in it. And uh, these are just uh, flow transmitters and these are differential double connected differentials here's a pneumatic control loop now if you look at this control loop and the symbols that are on it 
this circle, we have a discrete instrument, which is field mounted. The PT, in this case, is a pressure transmitter, and it's in loop number 103. This also has a generic gate valve on it, so that we can remove it from the system, so without opening or closing. This has a pneumatic line going from the pressure transmitter to another instrument, and this instrument is mounted either on the console or on a control panel, and it's a pneumatic controller, so this is a pressure indicator controller, the PIC, pressure indicate control, in loop 103. There is another pneumatic line from this con pressure controller to a generic valve, which is a generic pressure over uh, current or PI valve, so this is a pressure valve in loop 103, so this is an instrument loop, and this FO means that this valve is designed to be fail open, so if the valve fails, if the control fails, if you lose air pressure, this valve will open in its failed state. which leads you to the valve failures. So valves can fail, and again, we just talked about this last week. Valves can be fail, fail open. They can fail close. They can fail locked. They can fail in the last position they were in and then drift open, or they can fail in the last position they were in at the time of the failure and then drift closed. These valves also have, excuse me, symbols that represent what they, or what type of valve they are. I apologize for the size of this slide, uh, but these are some of the symbols that are used for the different fail type valves. You'll see there's two methods, method A, method B. There is no standard as to which symbol is used. I see both of them. I've even seen both of them used on the same drawings. So you'll see some of the, like fail open. This one is just a, a valve with FO. This one is a valve with an arrow for the actuator pointing up. So it's failed open. Fail close with an FC. Here the actuator has an arrow down. Fail close. So if you look at these, the symbol fairly mu pretty much describes what the fail failure mode on these valves are. And there is a whole list of these in the standard. Here's another electronic, this one here is a, an electronic control loop. This happens to be loop number 205. So all of these instruments are in loop 205. Here is a FT, which is a flow transmitter. It's electronic. Notice I have an electronic or an electrical line type connecting those instruments. And it's wired to another t instrument, which is an FIC, which is a flow indicator controller. So if I look at this instrument, this particular instrument is is normally accessible to the operator. It's a discrete instrument. This instrument is field mounted. It, the symbol tells me that it's field mounted. Here is another discrete instrument field mounted. This is FY. Hmm, FY in loop 205. So I know it's flow but the Y, and we didn't talk about Y yet. We talked about X being something that is um, special case. Well, this is also special case. This one has a designator on this with this little square with a slash in it, meaning IP, 
for transducer. This happens to be a flow transducer, which is current over pressure. Notice there is a pneumatic line going from this instrument to the valve, but there's an electric signal coming from this electronic flow indicator controller to this particular transducer. So this is literally changing electric to pneumatic and the electric is usually 4 to 20 milliamps. The pneumatics is usually 3 to 15 psi that based on an electric signal it will also change the pressure going to this valve. This is a flow valve in loop 205 to open and close this valve and this particular valve is fail open. There's a flow meter. It's an orifice plate. There's the flanges. It shows the orifice opening. There is an instrument on it which is a discrete instrument mounted in the field and it is a flow element which is 205. So you can read these loop diagrams simply by understanding the symbols and the symbology that goes around about making up these systems.